The On The Mark podcast is brought to you in part by Synovus. Synovus, the bank of here. Welcome to On The Mark, a PGA Tour podcast. Here's your host, someone who walks inside the ropes but thinks outside the box, Mark Immelman. It is Sunday evening, March the 5th, and I am in a hotel room getting ready for the first two rounds of a collegiate golf event. Yes, I am a college golf coach, I'm a golf instructor, I'm a broadcaster, and I am the host of this On The Mark podcast. How's it? I am Mark Immelman. Thank you for downloading this one. And as I speak to you, I've got the golf one in the background. And congratulations to Dustin Johnson. My goodness gracious. He has just clicked it into a different gear. Just such a wonderful leaderboard on offer there at the World Golf Championships events down, event down in Mexico. Wonderful golf course down there. McElroy, Spieth, Justin Thomas, Phil Mickelson, John Rahm. I mean, it was a battle for the ages there. But DJ, again, just went to a different level. And I think I mentioned it in a previous podcast when I was covering Dustin there for PGA Tour Live at the Genesis Open at Riviera that at one stage I said to my broad, my, my producer on the broadcast, off the air, obviously, I just didn't think it was a fair fight. And Dustin is looking all the part now, world's number one golfer. Rory was making his presence felt, and I'm just so excited for the next few events upcoming. I'm excited for this podcast too, as I say, I'm a college coach and a large part of my job is naturally as a golf instructor. That's kind of my bent. Um, but as a college coach, I, I, I rarely strive to be a, a a coach who develops human beings into better people who happen to become better golfers. I'm very interested in the content of our young golfers' character more than anything else. And so a part of that is helping players to emotional roundedness, to mental well-being, and all these elements that you can't necessarily quantify. And in my opinion, you know me if you've listened to this a lot. I love Bob Jones. He is my hero. Um, He references that five inches between your ears, that fairway that is the most important fairway there is, the 15th club as certain folks call it. Understanding the mind and how the mind works in my estimations, is, well, look, look, if Bob Jones says it, I'm there. And and, and I've seen it at the highest level. I've worked with major champions. I've worked with PGA Tour winners. I've worked with European Tour winners. I've worked with collegiate champions. These folks, they manage themselves well mentally and emotionally. And I want to bring that to you. If you're just joining our tribe here, welcome. I appreciate you. You can find other podcasts at pgatour.com slash podcast or pgatour.com slash on the mark or just subscribe to us. That's probably better at iTunes or Stitcher or TuneIn. Go and listen to some previous podcasts. There's everything there for you from a physical standpoint, mental standpoint. Garrett Kramer has been here explaining to you how the mind works in the past. Go and listen to those. Go and empower yourself. Go and grow completely, holistically. Um, but I'm big on empowering you guys. And I've been fortunate through my career to spend some time around Dr. Bob Rotella, who is certainly one of the thought leaders, in my opinion, in all of the world. He's, he was ranked as one of the top 10 golf teachers of the 20th century. He's written numerous, numerous best-selling books. Uh, golf is not a game of perfect is the best sports psychology book of all time. And a number of other books he's written, more than 15. Uh, he not just works, he doesn't just work with athletes and, and top flight golfers. Uh, Bob Rotella works with leading business people and organizations. And everyone seeks him out to help, you know, figure out what's going on between the ears and, and to get the attitude straight and, and help with visualization and all those elements that help top flight achievers achieve consistently. And so I reached out to Dr. Bob and I'm like, please join us. Please share some of your wisdom with the listenership. And thankfully, he agreed. So actually, I've just gotten off the phone with him and we've just recorded this uh, this interview, which I know will bless you. And so I urge you to share it with your friends. I know you want to beat them uh, in your little weekend NASA or whatever the case might be. And I'm sure there's bragging rights on hand. But let's share this. Let's get this moving around because... I want everyone who comes into contact with this On The Mark podcast to start playing better golf. And for for my money, I know this for sure, it starts between your ears. 
This segment of the On The Mark podcast is brought to you by Synovus. Synovus, the bank of here. Dr. Barbara Tiller, it is a real pleasure to have you on the On The Mark podcast. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you doing, Mark? I'm fine, thank you very much. In fact, I thought you'd probably ask me that question given your history and our history together, but I, I, I'm, I'm doing great. I'm going to leave it right there because I want to get to it and we've got limited time and so many questions. Um, a few folks have tweeted us and they've asked questions to pitch to you. I'll get to those in, a, in a, just a little while. But before I go okay. there, um, the Dr. Barbara Tiller I know is really a mentor, you know, someone I would turn to for advice all the time, as do many great golfers. And and, and I want to get, before I, I dig into some questions, kind of dig into your theory and, and, and how you perceive how the mind works. And with all the great sports people you've worked with, if you can just wax there for a little while for the listeners so they can get a feel for who you are and then we'll dig right into it. Well, I don't know if I have any big theories. Um, pretty much go by what works and what is known. But the bottom line is, as, as athletes, we have a free will. And mm-hmm. so we get to choose how we want to think about ourselves. So true. We get to choose how we perceive ourselves. We get to choose how we perceive our golf swings and our talent and our games. And you just seem to do a lot better if you're in a great state of mind rather than an average or mediocre <laughs> state of mind. Um you know, sometimes people ask me, uh, you know, d- am I supposed to be so positive that I'm like Pollyanna or something? And I always say, well, you know, it's a good question, but mm-hmm. um, it's it's just I-, I can tell you this: you don't have a chance if you're negative. Yeah. And the, the, the so positive thinking doesn't guarantee that you're going to be successful, but it guarantees you that you're going to find out if you have the ability to play at the level you want to play at. And, you know, when you're negative, you don't ever get to find out. Mm -hmm. You don't know if it's your game or your talent or your attitude. So, I mean, that's basically it. And then it's just basically you have to learn to stay in the present moment and get your head in a good place. And even at the top level, it's a heck of a challenge to think of nothing but where you want the ball to go. Yeah, certainly. And and totally commit to that. Uh Uh-huh. Well, pardon me. Go ahead. No, no, no. I, I was. I, I hated to cut over, but you know, as you talk, it kind of gets me thinking of the two things that I've learned from you, and I would sort of call them the capstones. Um, you know, you, you, you reference your uh, your outlook and 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 that quote that you shared with me. Um, that what people become depends largely on what they think of themselves. And then, then you've yeah. also said to me time and time again when we've chatted, you like the mental game. You feel like it's it needs to be worked on. It needs to be trained as much as what the physical aspects of things do. Yeah, I think it's very intriguing that people think that they have to work on their physical swing, but they don't think they should have to work on their mental or emotional game. And I think a lot of people just love to say, well, it's just the way I am. Uh-huh. I just, so you know, true. That's the way I've always been. And I go, well, you didn't used to be able to have a good golf swing. You didn't decide <laughs> not to practice because you didn't have a good swing or a good stroke or whatever. So, yeah, I mean, I, you know, we are very much a victim of habit as human beings. Mm-hmm. And the bottom line is – I got to get people to create good habits and to create good habits, you got to do it on a consistent basis uh, day after day. And eventually it starts becoming pretty habitual to have an optimistic outlook and to think positively and be decisive and committed over your shots. But it's very easy to get away from it. And so you got to constantly catch it. And I just, you know, I think the more you can catch it when you're half an inch away, uh, you can really start to separate yourself from people. Most of the people I work with across different sports, you know, are trying to separate themselves from everyone else mm-hmm. on the planet Earth who does what they do. Yeah. And you're not going to separate yourself by doing the things that everybody does. So, so I mean, true. it's really usually going to be the things that are pretty hard for other people to do. Would you and, say would would you say that working on the mental elements and, and exercising yourself that way, to use the verb, is harder in many respects than than getting out there and working on the putting stroke, spending time in the driving range? Well, I mean, it's actually easier to work on it because you could sit in mm-hmm. a chair or lie in bed or on a couch, um, or be going for a walk and work on it, but it's probably harder for most people because it's a lot easier to lie about what's going on inside your head to yourself. So in other words, so true. you know, we can't take a picture of it. You know, it doesn't show up on television. Um, it's, you know, you're the only one who really knows what you're thinking. Mm-hmm. And so you have to be very honest with yourself. I think that's 
you know, someone asked me the number one thing I see in players that are really successful. It's, it's how unbelievably honest they are about, you know, they, they know the difference between missing a shot and missing a shot because they didn't give it a chance because they had some doubt or fear in their head mm-hmm. uh, or they got distracted or they let their eyes wander over to the trouble or they started thinking about missing a putt or sculling a chip shot or something. And they're very honest about it. And I think a lot of people would like to not be honest because most things in life you can kind of fudge and justify you can kind of get away with not being honest. And uh-huh. I've always said, I don't know how, but the golf ball knows what you're thinking. And, uh, <laughs> That's <so> true. <laughs> you, know, it's, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a funny way of saying it, but it's, it's a really good way to look at the game. When you come to grips with the fact that most of the time the ball is going to go where you're thinking. Uh-huh. And, you know, if it doesn't go where you're thinking, it's because your thinking has gotten so bad that now you're going to hit it the opposite direction because you intentionally made sure it didn't go where you're thinking. But, I mean, it's it's a simple way of looking at it. And I think most tour players will say, I mean, their ball usually goes wherever their last thought is. So if I can get my head in the right place, uh, I'm going to be in pretty good shape. Well, two observations so, to that, and then I want to I want to get into maybe mm-hmm. one or two of your thoughts to this. And um, I interviewed Jason Day here recently at the Genesis Open, and he was driving it all over Los Angeles. And I mm-hmm. asked him about yep. it afterwards, and he said to me, he goes, honestly, I've just got to clean up myself mentally. And, and, and you know, yeah. I found that intriguing, um, and we all know Jason's visualization process, and I want your commentary there. But I think of a quote. Uh, Byron Nelson made back in the day, I read this, I obviously never had the good fortune of meeting Lord Byron, but he said, if I want to hit the ball high, I think high. If I want to hit it low, I think low. <laughs> so so comment further there, please. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that's the bottom line. It's, what's interesting, almost every tour player, if they do a clinic for kids, mm-hmm. and kids ask them how to hit it high or how to hit it low or how to hit a big hook or a big cut, I mean, they'll all say, oh, I'm just showing off for kids. I just think low and hit low. Mm -hmm. I want to hit a hook. I just think hook and hit a hook. Yeah. And they do beautifully. They say, if I ever play in a tournament, the way I hit shots when I'm doing a clinic for kids, I'd be awesome. (laughs) But yeah, I mean, so down deep, they all know that it's there, but now the ability to trust yourself when you're in something called a tournament, you know, like this week, they've got that world golf championship in Mexico city Uh with a tree line golf course that they don't see very often on tour. No. And then they've got, you know, greens that are a little more challenging than normal that they're not familiar with and uh, with a lot of poem and stuff. And, I mean, a lot of guys talked about it on TV that they just weren't committing and they were second-guessing themselves on the greens. And But I thought Dustin, who just won, was uh, I thought he was beautiful. They asked him, you know, they said, you really had a rough day the first day with your putting. You missed about five putts inside of five feet. Mm-hmm. How did you not panic? And he said, well... You know, I've probably done that, but he said, you know, on Thursday, I missed a lot of putts, but I really liked that I hit them all where I was looking, and they just didn't go in. So it wasn't like I was feeling terrible about my stroke. So I said it was pretty easy for me to just keep my head together and keep it clear. It becomes more challenging when you feel like your stroke is way off or something. But when people tell me that, I go, well, how does it make sense that if your stroke or your swing is off, that you should also think poorly. Uh, that true. makes no sense. That is so I mean, true. The, the one thing you can do is commit and trust your routine and your process. So, I mean, at the very least, you try and get people to do that. But it's amazing how many people justify being indecision, indecisive, or playing with doubt um, because their swing's not where they want it. And they'll say, well, when I get it in the slot, then I'll think good. I go, well, anybody <laughs> can do that. And, and you uh-huh. know, as you know, on tour – you know, probably at least 40% of the time their game isn't where they want it. And you know, you got to be able to score regardless. And I think that's where, you know, we can talk about skills, we can talk about confidence, but at some point you have to have belief that you can get the ball in the hole. And it really doesn't have much to do with your skills once you're on the golf course. Yeah, I mean, so we spend true. a lot of time preparing them. Mm-hmm. But once you get on the course, it's like you got to take what you got and go play with it. Okay, I, I want to do this for the listener because I've had the benefit of being around you when you're working with a top flight player and, and you have a wonderful way of sort of making it um, reactive and athletic and you will stand on the range with a good player and, and, and the block practice, this is a side, this is not working on technique. You'll just look at the guy, mm-hmm. the player in question and say, all right, hit a draw that lands over there and hit a fade and, and, and you sort of 
you, you get them into the visualization process and then just like look and, and see and feel the shot and deliver. Share that for the listener, please. I think it's a great way to practice. Well, I, I, I'd say it's about hitting golf shots instead of working on your swing. It's really mm-hmm. a matter of making sure you understand that when you get in competition and on a golf course, you got to be able to hit golf shots. And so, I mean, you got to keep your imagination alive. And most people have a lot of imagination when they're little kids. Mm -hmm. And over time, they kind of, they, they learn how to do everything with their conscious brain. And to be a good golfer, you have to, when you're on the golf course, you have to learn to do it, you know, with your imagination and, and your subconscious brain. And, but it takes a lot of trust to do that. But I mean, it's no different than a pianist when they begin maybe learning how to read notes and where do their fingers go on the piano. And at some point to make beautiful music, you have to let go of any of that conscious instruction. So true. And you just hear the song in your head and your hands just go like crazy on the piano and hit all the right keys. And people have never played an instrument that go, God, how do you always hit the right key? How do you, don't you ever worry about missing? Yeah. Well, they could but they've learned that I've got to just hear the music and my fingers somehow go in all the right places. Well, and, you know, we do it like if you're an artist, like if you live near or Disney and you go and see those people, the artists who do the caricatures, mm-hmm. they'll stand there, they'll look at you and they'll do a drawing that looks just like you, but they never look at the paper. They're looking at your face yeah, true. and their hand just somehow magically <laughs> does a drawing of your face. And it's, I, That's how you have to play golf. I want your opinion here, Dr. Bob. Um, in the era of information that we kind of in right now, especially as it pertains mm-hmm. to golf, when everything almost is quantifiable, I mean, there are numbers and, and, and ratios and, and, and all sorts of paraphernalia basically ascribed to everything. Do you mm-hmm. think perhaps for the lay golfer, it's hard to, to look upon things with such a imaginative, childlike, um, responsive, open sort of a mind? I think it's hard, yeah. I mean, I, I think what happens, and this is the difference between, well, let's just take the basketball and golf. Um, when I was 10 years old, my dad bought me Bill Sherman on shooting. It was about okay. a 50-page book on how to shoot a basketball. Mm-hmm. No one has disagreed with anything in that book since 1959. Okay. You go to any country in the world, and everyone would use the same language, the same vocabulary, and would agree on the technique. So there's no war on the correct technique for shooting a basketball. Mm-hmm. In golf, you could go to a different teacher, even though there's, you know, you're probably a member of a professional golfers association. Yeah. Um, there's no uniform agreement on how to, what a correct golf swing is. I mean, it's like there's a war going on uh-huh. and you could basically get a different lesson from a different teacher every day for the next 10 years. And every day it'd be a different lesson. And I think that makes it very difficult for people to really go practice one approach. And yet, you know, for most adults who are listening, if they have a child who decides he wants to be a good golfer, they send that kid to one teacher like they'll send them to you, for example. Okay. And that kid won't read another thing about the golf swing. He has no interest in the golf swing. You're like his God, and you, everything you tell him is gospel, and he does only what you tell him to do, and he does whatever practice you tell him to do, and he becomes a really good player. Mm-hmm. But it's amazing how parents will do that for their kids, but for themselves, it's like they want to be able to go to the clubhouse and talk about the golf swing for hours. They don't really care if they can <laughs> so swing true. So or true. if they can hit golf shots or golf ball. They like to talk about it. And <laughs> it's fascinating. It is. How differently we, te- we treat our kids versus you know, ourselves in many cases. Well, yeah. And, and, and as I've spent time around you and I've, I've researched this more because I would say you're very influential and in, in having had an influence on me uh, becoming a really holistic golf instruction and, and looking at the mm-hmm. overall picture, not just the physical element of it, because I'm firmly of the belief that mind, body, spirit, soul, all that sort of stuff, if it's jiving, then the player is able to deliver nicely. But, you know, if there's incoherence somewhere, then things start kind of working against each other. Well, you're right. And you know what's, what's fascinating, Mark, is that we tend to make the mistake of pretending Okay, you're a golf teacher. I'm a sports psychologist. You work with the body. I mm-hmm. work with the mind. Yeah. 
as if the mind and body are totally separate entities. And the truth of the matter is, I don't know where the mind begins and the body starts, or where the body ends and the mind starts. Mm -hmm. All I know is they're unbelievably intertwined and interconnected. And you have to have them both in a very nice place in order to be able to do the things you teach. Yeah. Um, but it's a lot easier if you have a teacher that's helping you make it simple. Like I talk a lot about, I, I think it was fascinating that like Harvey Pennock's Little Red Book Love became it. the best-selling sports book in history, not just in golf, but in all sports. And people loved it and told their friends to read it. And then they'd say, well, it's a really good book. But Mr. Peck didn't know anything about the golf swing. Oh, I go, yeah, but uh, all of his students became really good golfers, yeah, guys and true. gals, mm -hmm. all the members of his club, um, because he made it so simple because he didn't want people to be confused and tied up enough. And I think one of the neat things is he never made anybody worse. And so he almost true. always made people better. And, you know, and, and that's what you'd want. Certainly in any other sport, if you had a coach, you'd want a coach who helped you get better and you definitely didn't want a coach who made you worse. And that's the danger when you start making it too complicated. Um, you know, and some people want to say, well, I'm just not a visual person or I'm not a field player. You know, I'm a technical player. I would say everybody at some point gets to the level where they are playing with, with imagination and feel and are getting past technique. Um, yeah. In every sport, not just golf. I mean, you have to get to that. That's really what being athletic, as you mentioned, about being reactive. I mean, at some point, you have to come to grips with the fact that being an athlete means you're unconsciously reacting to a target or a picture or a trajectory, but, you know, something that's out there that you're responding to. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's, oh, man, I, 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 I'm contemplating as you're talking and my mind is running right with me and right now. I've just got questions swimming around the head, but I, I've got to go here a little bit. Um, I'm going to toss a few words at you, Dr. Bob, and, and they're sort of on the heels of, again, questions that have been pitched me. I, I want to talk about visualization because I know you're big on that one. I want to talk mm -hmm. about um, temper, you, you know, because the reaction to shots too i i find it as fascinating so i want you to take there and then nerves so so let's please talk about visualization visualization and routine uh temper and nerves in your opinion well first of all with visualization i mean i think there's a lot of different ways of visualizing i think we tend to take it very literally and think i have to stand behind the ball and i actually have to see the golf ball fly through the air and land and stop or go in the hole or whatever. That's hard. And, you know, yeah, when you think about it, I mean, most people, if you've played golf long enough, I mean, like, if you just pick a target out there in the distance, you don't have to tell your brain that that's where I want the ball to go. Mm -hmm. You don't have to actually see it in your mind. Your brain is so brilliant that if you pick a target and you're playing golf, your brain unconsciously knows that you're playing golf and wants the ball to go there. Okay. So it's not like you have to tell it, I want this ball to go there. You just have to look at it. All right. And, you know, if you were playing soccer, you'd totally understand that. Of course. You know, if you were playing soccer, you would never say, I've got to stop and visualize. So, I mean, some of the problem is we tend to engulf, make even visualizing into this really hard, serious, you know, conscious thing that you have to do. Yeah. And it's really a very unconscious activity. If you just pick a target, it happens. You know, and that's where you'd like to get to. Okay. Um, so, I, you know, I want to make it as simple as possible. I, I want people to do whatever comes most natural. I mean, and I've heard a lot of different descriptions of it. Some actually see it. Some actually, you know, see something in black and white. Some see it in color. Um, and a lot of people have different, like with putting. I mean, you have people who, you know, they'll say it's like a laser burn in the green. You have other people who say, I see a slide in the ground. Okay. I've had people say they feel like there's a magnet under the ground. I mean, so there's a lot of ways people see things that are very unique to them. And it's like whatever comes naturally, as long as it's consistent with where you want the ball to go. I mean, what you, what you don't want to be doing is thinking about where you don't want it to go. Yeah, I mean. Well, how about this then? Let's say you've got one of those sucker pin positions and you shouldn't be going there yep. and, and, and you're trying to aim away, but your mind's wandering back to the flag because I, I, I hear you what you're saying. You don't have to think about the yep. target. It's just there. But the well, I would say that's where most double crosses happen at the top. Okay. All right. And it's really, it's a mental discipline where if you're, 
if your target is 15 steps left of the flag, you have to be picking a target that's over there, and you have to have the discipline to look at your target, not the flag. In other words, the flag's only your target if you're shooting at it, but it's a mental discipline, and I think you have to practice it a lot. And, you know, at the top level, we do have guys practice it a lot. It's, It's the same way. Um, I mean, you're from South Africa. I grew up caddying a lot with Bobby Locke, who mm-hmm. played this from my no. hometown in yeah. Vermont. And I mean, he would be very big on the idea that, you know, if the, if it's a six inch left to right break, he's looking six inches left of the hole yeah. and let the green break the ball in the hole. Um, well, it's the same discipline. If you line up six inches left and then your last look is at the hole, you're probably going to push it. Yeah, it's so true. Just because that's what athletes do, they respond to what they last uh, looked at. Yeah, all right. Well, look, that, ladies and gents, if you forget everything, remember that you were going to respond to what you last see. Okay, that, that's sort of part routine, part visualization. Um, uh-huh. The routine, I, I know you're not big on sort of calculating the thing, but what about for the listener who doesn't potentially, or they're listening to this going, I don't have a pre-shot routine, what would your recommendation be? Well, the first thing I'd say is you need to get one. I'd make it uh-huh. as short and simple as possible. Um, I don't care if you stand behind the ball or stand next to it, but don't step up to the ball until you've picked a target and committed to the shot you're going to hit. Yeah, okay. And then I would say, you know, if I had my choice, uh, I mean, I would say take one look and one waggle or two looks and two waggles. And, I, you know, I say waggle. I mean, that'd be the, a very simple routine for yes. most people. Yeah. Um, the longer you take, the more discipline you have to have to not get distracted. And you certainly give yourself more opportunity to be distracted. That's a really good point. And get your muscles in your body tight. Mm-hmm. I think everyone, I'd like them to have, whether it's a waggle or a knee kick or a head turn, but you need something as a trigger that's really simple for you to do that keeps you moving and keeps you from getting too stationary. I mean, and it's not that you can't do the other, I mean, because we've seen some players who don't do a waggle or a yeah. move, but in general, you'd be a lot better off to get one. Now, the second thing I'd say about routine is it's amazing in my work, how many people have a putting routine, but they won't have a routine with their pitching. And then they get lost and wonder. So, I mean, you want to have a routine with every part of your game. I don't care if it's a little different for your long game versus your putting versus your pitching, but you need to have a routine. And the simplest thing I can say is go sit down in your room and write down physically and mentally what your routine is for every part of your game, Mm -hmm. and then go out and practice doing that. And if any other thought gets in your mind, walk away and start over. If you start taking an extra waggle, stop and walk away and and get away from it and really discipline yourself to mentally and physically do the mental process or routine that you said you were going to do before you went to the first tee until you can do it with every club in your bag all of the time. You know, like my attitude is, well, you've got to be prepared for a tee shot on the 18th tee at Augusta, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, when you're tied for the lead of the masters, because that's what you're getting ready for, Mm -hmm. or you've got to be ready for a five and a half foot putt on the last green, you know, tied for the leader with a one shot lead. And if you're not getting ready for whatever your tournament is, it may be your club championship or whatever. If you're not getting ready for that, then it's like, what are you getting ready for? Yeah. Great point. You know what? I, I hear the term discipline often and it, it, it gets me yep. thinking further. I mean, it's a big deal as part of obviously we physical work and mental work too. I want your commentary mm-hmm. on temper because, um, you know, a lot of these folks, list, yes, folks kind of getting a bit irate at shots not going their way. Uh, so your thoughts there, please, Dr. Bob. Well, I mean, first of all, before anyone goes the first tee, I want them to have already admit it that golf is a game of mistakes, and so they're going to make plenty of mistakes. Yeah. Uh-huh. I think second thing is you've got to be prepared. How am I going to respond to my mistakes? Are you going to beat yourself up and decide they're stupid and you're a jerk or a choke, or are you going to just accept them? So I'm very much into wanting people to prepare their mind that they're going to make mistakes, but you're not going to be bothered by it. I mean, you you have to get to the point where where they just don't mean anything to you. And a lot of people want to give them meaning. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, it's like we were just talking a minute ago about Dustin just won against the best players in the world, and he missed five putts inside five feet on the first day of the tournament. Yeah. Another day, he had a ball stick up in a tree. 
you know. Um, and he still won the tournament against the best players in the world. And you'll see people, you know, playing in the fifth flight of the club tournament who missed two putts and they decide <laughs> it's mind. over. You know? <laughs> yeah, <true. laughs> so, I mean, it, it takes, but it's a discipline. And some of it is you have to train yourself. I talk a lot about you train it and then you trust it. But I mean, the bottom line is you have to get to the point where you know what you're going to do. So, you know, like when you work with someone on their golf swing, I promise you, you're trying to increase predictability. Of course. You know, you want to pre- be able to pre- be more predictive of what their ball's going to do when it leaves their glove face. Well, we want people to be more predictive of what their emotions are going to be and what their minds are going to be. And, you know, someone will ask me, well, is there never a situation where getting mad could be helpful? I mm-hmm. go, well, yes. I could find a situation, and it's possible that occasionally you'll get mad, determined, mad, decisive, and you narrow your focus and really play great. But if you played a lot of golf, it would destroy your insides um, and ultimately maybe get you thrown out of the club or whatever or out of the <laughs> tournament. True. But most great players have been pretty calm uh, and don't overreact to situations. Um, but, I mean, you know, every once in a while, someone's like on tour is playing at 7 o'clock in the morning they're still not awake yet, and they mm-hmm. make two bogeys. And to coach themselves, they really need a little kick in the butt True. to wake themselves up. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, at some point, you got to be good at coaching yourself. The problem is people tend to give themselves what they feel like giving themselves rather than what they need. So if you're really good at coaching yourself, you could know when to give yourself a little kick in the butt yeah. and when you need to pat yourself on the back. So true. Um, but a lot of people don't do it when they need it. They, they give themselves the wrong thing. They give their best friend what they need, and they give themselves what they feel like giving themselves, <laughs> which is usually the wrong thing. I'm hearing you, and I'm hearing Coach, the legendary Coach Bill uh, Wooden, speaking of you know a real art to John coaching. Wooden, yeah. yeah, John, pardon me, John Wooden, uh, realizing that sometimes you need to pat folks on the bat, back, and sometimes you should just pat them a little bit lower down. <laughs> Doctor yep. Bob, you've been so yep. great. You've been so great with your time. I want to zip through a couple of quick questions that got tweeted us here on the Mark Radio for you. Go ahead. Um, here's one. Uh, the question was, how does a golfer get into the proverbial zone? Well, first of all, I don't think you get in the zone intentionally. Okay. The zone is something that happens probably one-tenth of one percent of all the time that you play golf. Okay. Becoming a really good golfer is all about how good do you play when you're not in the zone. No, that's and a great that's point. really what being a great golfer is about. If once in a blue moon, you're going to slip into a zone, and it really – all you can do is kind of help encourage its possibilities by having a good routine, by staying in the present moment, by being very accepting. And you might have a moment once in a while where for 18 holes or nine holes or even two days once in a while where it's so easy and so effortless to go sit here and sit here and sit here and sit here and start to just take the flow that it happened. But when people want to chase the zone, I go, oh man, that's a big mistake. Okay. You'll drive yourself nuts if every if you're upset anytime you're not in the zone. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't even at the pro level, very seldom are they in the zone. All right. It's can you play golf when you're not in the zone? Correct point. I mean, you know as a college golf coach. I mean <laughs> uh-huh. like you want to know can your kids play when they don't have it? You know what I mean? That's how great you know, though. are they gonna give up and die and shoot a million? That's how I grade them. That's how I grade them. Here's another one yeah. here. Um, why do I? Why do people? And I, I guess it's I. The question as it's pitched, tend to think negative and get a little bit more afraid when they or when I am under pressure. Well, I mean, basically, it's fear and doubt. Okay. I mean, when people are afraid that it's not going to turn out the way they'd like it to turn out, you know, they, they start getting very negative. All right. Um, you know, that's why, you know, in my last book, How Champions Think, I talk so much about the role of optimism. Mm-hmm. I think it's so important that you can see yourself winning tournaments in the future, that all of your work on your game is going to get rewarded somewhere down the line. Um, because the more comfortable you are with good things happening, uh, you can make mistakes and not care. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really accepting the fact that this is a game of mistakes by its nature. As a human being, you're prone to error, and so is everybody else in the field. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, 
I think when people panic, they start convincing themselves that no one else is going to make a mistake. I'm the only idiot making a mistake. <laughs> That's a great point. They start beating themselves up so and true. they panic uh -huh. instead of just playing their game. And the neat thing about golf is the other people in the field don't have to have any impact on you at all. I mean, you're just playing yourself in the golf course. Mm -hmm. And the more you can just, you know, it's like I want players to redefine winning as did I win the battle with myself? Did I get my head in the right place? Did I do the routine like I said I was going to do before I started? And did I not let anything bother me, upset me once I got in the golf course? If you can do that, well, then you can walk off the golf course, whether you won or didn't, and say, well, I feel like a winner. I, 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 I did what I could do today. It wasn't my turn. Yeah, I love that. Win the battle with yourself. Uh, last question here, yeah. Dr. Bob. Um, and you referenced Dustin, so I guess this question is a bit apropos. Um, when a golfer gets to world's number one, what advice would you offer and what advice would you offer that individual? Let's say they get to the top of their mountain, whatever it might be, to remain focused and motivated. Well, number one is you find out, you know, was your only goal in life to get to number one um, and now you're done or do you have bigger ideas in your head? Uh -huh. I think number two is you'd end up having a conversation about you're number one in the world because you earned it and you deserve it. Um, you don't have to prove to anybody that you belong there or, you know, because a lot of people will say they start feeling pressure to live up to it. I said, well, what do you okay. mean live up to right. it? You, you earned it. You, you, you got it by your performance. You deserve it. And so you just enjoy it. Um, and, you know, and the mistake people make is they start worrying about losing it now that they've got it. And it's like, you know, just go play your game. Yeah, you wouldn't be number one doing. if you weren't good. So just go play your game. And you'd like people to use it to take pressure off themselves and say, well, now I know my stuff works at the highest level. Now I've just got to go ahead and, and be in this mindset that I've been in recently on a regular basis. You, you, in general, you'd like people to write down, you know, what are they doing with their practice? What are they doing with their teacher? What are they doing with their mind and their emotions? Mm -hmm. And go back to it. Because the mistake is when you start becoming perfectionistic and think, you look for it's, something it's new. It's a fascinating thing. It's almost like people don't think they can live up to the thing they already did. And so <laughs> now true. I'm going to get perfectionistic so that I can prove that what I did wasn't a fluke. Instead of just saying, God, now I know this stuff works, I just got to go play my game. Yeah, man, you make so it sound you, so you simple. Have to be <laughs> even more patient with yourself um, and more accepting with yourself, that's for sure. Truly is. Okay, this one's for me. I know I'd said three questions, but I've got to ask you this. This is for me more than anything mm -hmm. else, and I'm sure there are a few golfers who this will resonate with who are listening to this podcast. Mm -hmm. um, you, you, you referenced your most recent book, um, and, and there's so many great tips in there. One of those is walking that fine line between caring too much and you know, and, and kind of freewheeling and, and not caring enough. Uh, please embellish yep. a little bit there. Well, I mean, I think, first of all, you have to know, you have to have a lot of self-awareness of yourself and figure out, am I a really serious hard working dude with some perfectionistic tendencies mm -hmm. who's more than likely to mess up because I care too much and try too hard. Okay. Or am I a lazy good for nothing who doesn't put anything into it, tends to get lazy and not go out there and prepare or practice. Um, who's so far from being perfectionistic that it's ridiculous. And I've given away a lot of rounds of golf and tournaments because I was sloppy and wasn't into it. So, I mean, I think once you come to grips with, you know, what do you really like, it's pretty easy to figure out, you know, <laughs> which direction you need to work in. The problem is most dedicated people always tend to think they never try hard enough or get serious enough or care enough or try harder enough. Mm -hmm. And lazy good for nothing bums think. Go the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean I'm not serious enough? You know, uh, yeah. I mean, that's where you need some people that you can trust that can help you with it. But it's, uh, it's, it's certainly something you have to learn. That, that's for darn sure. Well, you, you, you talk about people you can trust. That is one of the great tips in your most recent book, too, is to, to surround yourself with folks that you can trust. Dr. Bob, you've been so so great with your time. I'm sure there are thousands of more questions, and the folks want to reach out to you. Um, is there a website, somewhere where they can go, social media, whatever, whatever, whatever the case might be? Well, great talking to someone who's a member of the family of the year. <laughs> oh, you didn't go yeah. there. You didn't. Yeah, well, no, it wasn't the family of the year. That. It was my dad was the father of the year. How about that? Yeah, that was awesome. 
Yeah, He's a pretty good cool. man. A wonderful family, that's for sure. Well, you know, we've 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 been fortunate to spend time around you certainly, and, and you've been such a source of great counsel for me. And that's why it was it's a pleasure for me to bring some of your wisdom and your insights to the folks listening to this who who haven't had the benefit of spending time around you because it's it's simple sage wisdom that is applicable to all and sundry. Well, you know how much fun I've had knowing you and spending time with your brother and getting to know your family. Um well, just keep on loving golf and keep on going. Yeah, so true. Dr. Bob, I appreciate you very much. Continued success, and I hope we get to catch up very, very Thank soon. You, Mark. Good talking. Take care. Bye-bye. This segment of the On The Mark podcast was brought to you by Synovus. Synovus, the bank of here. <laughs> he truly is a legend, Bob Rotella. Um, so many things I've learned from him. He's been such an influence in so many great golfers' lives. I mean... Podrick Harrington, Davis Love, Rory McIlroy, my brother, he's worked with Dr. Bob. Countless golfers, countless business people have. I want to share one or two anecdotes that he always mentions. Number one, play to play great. Do not play not to play poorly. That's a great one. Another one, love the challenge of the day, whatever it might be. That is a huge one. Golf is going to take you up. It's going to take you down. Love the challenge, whatever it might be of the day. Uh, get out of the results and get into the process. Um, he also talks about being decisive and committed over anything else. And then my favorite, and I'm going to charge this one to you, love your wedge and your putter. Those are the scoring clubs. No social media for Dr. Bob, but a number of books. You can find them at most good bookstores and at Amazon. The big one, golf is not a game of perfect. Of course, how champions think. You heard Dr. Bob reference that one. A golfer's mind. Golf is a game of confidence. The 15th club. A life is not a game of perfect. Putting out of your mind. The golf of your dreams. The unstoppable golfer. The hundreds of them. Oh, hundreds. There are lots and lots of golf books written by the great Dr. Bob Rotella that are easy to read, easy to digest, and easy to apply. And if you don't have any... I would highly recommend maybe you go and get one and kind of start your journey to getting yourself mentally acute. I reference the 15th Club by Bob Jones Bunch. It is truly important. And being decisive, being committed, and remembering, as Dr. Bob said, that the ball normally goes where your last thought was is so important. So if you can... Get to a place where your thinking is positive, where your thinking is clear, where your mind works as it should. You're more than likely going to play better golf. I am Mark Immelman. Thanks for downloading this. Share it with your friends. It's good for them too. More podcasts can be found at iTunes, Stitcher, or TuneIn. Subscribe to us over there or at pgatour.com slash podcast. Get out and play some golf. Have a great time. Make lots of berries. Take it easy. This broadcast and all associated rights, including copyright, are owned exclusively by the PGA Tour and may not be used in whole or in part without the prior written permission of the PGA Tour. Synovus is the bank of here. Here is a fairway that took shape before engines replaced horses. Here's where some days you lay up and others you just go for it. Here's where you don't even need a tea time. And here's where a casual conversation on the back nine turns into a successful business expansion. Here should be the most important place to your bank, because here is where you are. Synovus, the bank of here. Banking products provided by divisions of Synovus Bank. Member FDIC, equal housing lender.